Okay, good morning. Uh, we will start now. So we, the third presenter is not here yet. We'll see if they arrive. Um, but first is the presentation from myself and my colleague, Professor Gutsia. So I'll hand over to her. Thank you, Victoria. And uh, good morning, everybody. <laughs> so I'm going to start with the presentation and then I'll hand over uh, to Victoria. Um, this project that we are reporting about is actually about one of our students who could not be here this week, um, uh, Megan, who did a project together with our Department of Architecture. I'll explain a bit about that. And then Cameron, who's here at the front, has taken over this project as part of his master, so it is um, carrying on. So this project is uh, something that we do together with uh, urban designers at the University of Pretoria. The urban designers look at the environment, uh, buildings, roads, gathering places, social places in a city, and then they try to improve the uh, situation. So they look at what's there currently, they design improve improvements, and then they communicate this to whoever is a stakeholder um, trying to uh, improve the quality of life of the people in that urban environment. Now the challenge, th this uh, particularly particular urban designers are in the Department of Architecture. So they were trained 30 years ago in South Africa, the lecturers, to design buildings that look like this one. Uh, very wonderful, very weird, the kind of thing that you think of if you uh, hear about architects. And you'll see all these international prizes for architecture for these weird and wonderful buildings. But the reality is this, we are in South Africa, we are building uh, research and reconstruction and development program houses. They look a bit like that. So how do you then teach the students to enhance an environment that looks like that, where every house is built like the other one, where there are not nice trees, there's not a nice environment, there's not, defi not necessarily um, parks for kids to play, for example, or for people to take them out. There's, as you can see, there's a lack of space for uh, hanging up your washing. It's just a very, very different environment. So one of their lecturers is like really passionate about teaching the young architects how to work in an environment that doesn't look like uh, those kind of buildings, but that looks like this kind of building. And that will also work towards um, enhancing the quality of life of the people living in this environment. Now the one challenge is that they they were not trained for this. And the other challenge is also they don't necessarily have all the technologies and they're not tech savvy um, to go out and do those kinds of things. Because if you go into an environment like that, it's all about spatial relationships and where are things and how far they're from each other and how can you introduce something new into that spatial environment. So they have to work with geospatial tools. So what we did is we followed a scenario-based approach, kind of working out um, what are their requirements we documented these requirements, and then we looked at uh, open source tools that they could use in this environment, um, and we made some recommendations to them. So Victoria is going to tell you about the different open source tools. I'm going to tell you about the requirements. So we looked um, at two kinds of uh, projects, and we talked to their lecturers and also people from industry trying to understand what they do. So for example, they would be asked to uh, advise the municipality on improvements in a neighborhood that has not been upgraded or looked after and that has become unsafe. So they have to understand how people move through that environment. So where are the roads? Where do the pedestrians go? Where do the taxis um, stop? How many of them are there? How do, you in do they influence um, the environment? Is there a road safety issue? Are there criminal factors in the uh, environment, where do people gather, where are those social gathering points that you could make nice for them by just planting trees or having a garden or something. And the other kind of project that they told us about is um, something that looks at environmental design, improving or getting rid of crime by changing the environment. So you would look at, uh, for example, roads or walkways where pedestrians walk whether there are trees where somebody could hide behind the tree, whether there are walls that kind of um, make things not visible, all those kinds of things. So the scenario is this, that, and, and you'll see it's very much like 
any other kind of field work. So you prepare your map, you study your map, you try to figure out from the map uh, where are the important areas to, to go. Then they take the students through these areas, like in transect walks, so they walk through to the area and whatever they see, they record. But the architects <laughs> have this, um, this soft side, this social side, so this um, trying to uh, experience the environment. So they want to take pictures, they want to take audio recordings um, to help them when they go back to the studio to remember what the area looked like. So it is about, yes, positioning and the distances, but it's also about experiencing the environment and for that you then need the photos and videos and things like that. Um, so you'll see on the right hand side, these, these are in, uh, close to uh, Pretoria where we come from. There's an informal settlement um, and they walk through that area and if you can see in the bottom photo, it's very overgrown. So that could be, it's a nice feature, but it could also be a safety issue if there's too much vegetation. Then they come back from the field and they do their annotations and they have their markings on paper. Um, and what we're trying to help them is to transfer these markings and things in a way that they can use it in their uh, digital world. These are some examples from photos that they come back with. So you'll see on the pedestrian walkway there is now a hawker stand and that could influence the way that the pedestrians walk. So one could look at uh, moving those hawker stands so that they uh, are not a barrier anymore. Um, here's another example of a lady working on something where they are taking the water that it doesn't go into their gardens. So once they come back to the studio, then they want to visualize this information, they want to play around with it, they want to look at scenarios. And specifically then the other three bullets look at how they can share this information, um, how, that, how they can keep this information for future years. Because they go into these areas every year uh, record information about those areas and it would also be nice to have a longitudinal study where you can see from one year to the other um, how, do the, how does the area change? What are the pictures from one year to the other year? So it is also a bit about uh, managing that data. So it's not only about collecting and analyzing but it's also about managing that data, having metadata to understand it. So we structured the functional and non-functional requirements into data collection, into data storage and management, and into visualization. So in terms of uh, collection, they want to prepare a map before going into the field. I think that's a normal thing to do. They want to record everything that they see there. They re want, want to record things about the observation. Obviously, one prefers the metadata to just happen automatically. It has to be simple and hassle-free. Some of those areas could be unsafe, so you don't want to be going around displaying things and struggling with your uh, smartphone or with your tablet and then get knocked over the head and then <laughs> be left without anything. And also there's not always internet. So you have to uh, be able to work in an environment where you can download data, record things and then go back and upload it. Um, data storage and management, so you want to upload the data when you're back, you want to view your observations against the, against the backdrop, for example, like a satellite imagery or topographical data, you want to make some small edits, you want to organize your data into folders, you want to be able to search for it, you want to share it with other people, um, and obviously you also need to be able to log in so that you can protect your data and so that you can share it with specific people, so they need to have uh, usernames and logins so that you can share it with those, or you can also have groups that you uh, share the data with. Um, then in terms of visualization, they want to add additional layers to the map, prepare a map for communicating the findings. So it's not only about collecting the data, but then these improvements that they are suggesting, they want to have tools to be able to do that. They need to export those maps, do some basic spatial analysis, and then it should be accessible by multiple team members. So at the university, they work in teams, but once in the, if they go into real life, there's usually a professional team. Um, so there would be engineers, there would be town planners, um, there would be uh, architects, urban designers, we're all working together on a simple project. Okay, then I'm gonna hand over to Victoria so that she can explain to you uh, what we found in terms of open source tools for uh, addressing these requirements. Thank you. Um, so uh, we only looked at open source 
tools, and also not all of them because there is unlimited number. Um, but the reason for open source is that we are based at the university. Funding is always limited, so that's why we need something that is um, free and also we are able to customize for our specific needs. So first one we looked at is EpiCollect. This is something that we use quite a bit with our students. Um, it's an open source. It works on all devices, so which is quite nice. It also works on iPhone, not only Android. Um, it's similar to all the other um, of these collection tools. You, have, you can easily set up a form with some various input types. You can see you can add a photo. There is facilities for voice recordings, um, videos, etc. Um, what is also nice is you can actually do the collection offline and then once you get back to campus, you can upload your data. Then on the um, back end side, there's a bit of a view where you can have a look at the data that was collected. Um, you can download it. So it's a very nice like little preview functionality. One drawback of um, EpiCollect is that uh, it can only collect data for a specific point where you are at at that moment. So it is in the field, I'm observing a specific statue and I collect the information. I cannot go and edit other things, I can't collect put, um, streets, lines, things like that. So then the next one we looked at was Arbiter. So this is part of the um, a larger project called Geoshape and this is one section that focuses on data collection. So it's also open source, but it's limited to Android devices. So um, what it does, it allows you to take a WMS layer, add it on top of OSM backdrop, and then you can add to this feature, or to this WMS layer, or actually edit it. Um, so it can also be used offline, um, easy to use. But the big difference is that you can now actually go and add features. So you can see there, there's a bit of a line that was captured instead of just collecting points at your specific location. The only problem with this is, although our phones are getting bigger, the screen is still quite small. So if you want to do very large features, it can be quite difficult to actually now go and do a proper digitizing of this feature. Um, Geo ODK, so this is the specialized version of ODK that adds spatial features. Um, again, only focuses on Android. Um, very similar to EpiCollect, there's a form builder where you, can act, where you can create your forms. There's a translation between XLS, offline data collection, etc. Um, here there is a bit more specialized features, but it, it does requ require a bit more technical knowledge to actually set up and use than something like Kobo Toolbox or even EpiCollect. Um, the next one is Field Papers. So this is quite a nice application. So there's a little bit of a story that they have on their website. You can specify your area, print out an atlas of maps, so you have a set of maps um, based on your open street map. You can go into the field, create your annotations, draw your areas where you've observed something, go back to the office, scan these in. They are automatically georeferenced into a JOSM, and then you can go and digitize this information. So this is quite cool for the architects. When you saw the pictures that Serena showed, where there's all these drawings and things like that, this is very similar to what they are actually using in the field. Um, it's quite easy to use and requires not a lot of technical know-how. The JOSM part of it does require some skill, um, but that is something you can quite easily teach um, a novice. The next two is for data management. That's map server and geo server. So we've grouped these two together. Um, because they do very similar things. So both of them is a middleware where you can publish your data. So from your database, you use Web Server or Geo Server to expose your data as web services, such as WFS, WMS, etc. Um, generally, your user does not interact with Geo Server. You only receive information, and in some cases, you can write information back into the database with something like WFSD. Okay, Geo Network. So that's a catalog. Um, 
you can add the metadata for all your data sets using your specific standards. So it focuses a lot on the ISO standards. So you can see ISO 19115, 19119, etc. And what is also nice is if you have multiple Geo servers, you can connect it automatically to Geo network and it will harvest all the metadata from these Geo servers. Um, it's searchable using keywords, bounding boxes, themes, etc. So it's and then there's a little bit of a viewing functionality, which is quite limited, but it does give you the opportunity to at least see the data before you decide to use it. Okay, do you note? Uh, do you note is almost like the WordPress of the spatial world. So this allows you to add information. So we do so do network just collects the metadata. The user can now go and actually add the information into the network and then do some basic type of functions on it. So they can create maps, you can connect it to your um, QGIS and make edits using your web services. So it's a, it's a bit more interactive than Geo Network that is more like just finding information. Then map window QGIS. So these two are very basic um, desktop GIS applications. So they both have a core that is quite extendable with plugins. So I don't know if you guys know Map Window. It looks very much like the Esri software. I think it was created as a alternative to that. So it has very it has the same feel to it. And then QGIS is quite familiar in this environment. Um, Map Window is limited to Windows, where QGIS is available on all platforms. Both are quite user-friendly, a lot of documentation is available, um, but QGIS has a lot more input options. So you can connect your WFSs, you can use JSON, etc. Okay. Uh, some technical difficulties, but you can see the most important information. Um, so we did a bit of an analysis with the softwares compared to the different um, requirements. So C is for, it's part of the core functionality, and you might see on the next slide an A, which is part of additional functionality. So in general, um, things such as map server and use server, they're not really part of the data collection functionality because their function is more about hosting and management. So when it comes to data collection, all the softwares do provide most of these requirements. It's just EpiCollect and GeoODK, where the, you can't prepare the map, it's more of in-field observations. So that is a bit of, there you would use something such as QGIS to prepare, prepare the maps beforehand before you use EpiCollect. Then the um, results, the data um, storage, um, there's quite a bit of categories, but here you can see the additional functionalities. So for example, viewing and observing of data, viewing of observations is available in most of the projects, except for field papers, because your applications such as um, GeoNode, MapView, et cetera, provide these additional functionalities to view this. Um, so the one, uh, sorry about that. So the one year that definitely stood out was GeoNode for the simple fact that the architects or users would be able to collect their own data and up upload it without going through the process of loading it into the database, then loading it into Geo server before publishing the data. Then lastly, it's the visualization. So for this, we, only the last four is really relevant, with your desktop GIS being definitely the standouts, as they allow you to create maps, do analysis, do some styling, so that is, that is their main purpose. Okay, so then just some last concluding thoughts. Um, so this was now very, we did the analysis and the scenarios based on 
um, urban designers, but you could use this for a multitude of other fields. The same results can be applied to someone in economy, etc. Um, it's also very important that this was a very modular design. So if we pick, for example, for Cameron's project, to use GeoNote, it should be able to accept input from various applications. So we don't want someone to just be able to use EpiCollect. They should have a choice between EpiCollect or field papers, etc. Then, yeah, you should pick the tools that is best suited for your specific application. This is just the kind of a guideline for someone that is not familiar with these tools so that they can select the ones that suit their specific application. Thank you to everyone. Thanks. Any questions? Thank you. Map server versus girl server. Finally, which one did you use? Um, so for the current implementation that Cameron is busy with um, for his master's project, he's using G server. And are you going to go to map server or you stay with girl server? Um, for the moment, we'll st stay with G server because it's just something we are more familiar with. Uh, we like the interface, the styling, um, the advanced styling options that is available, and the integration that's already available within GeoNote. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, thank you. Uh, to capture data from uh, the field for surveyors, uh, mostly using DWG, what do you recommend uh, as software to uh, import and um, uh, extract it to, uh, to database? Okay, so um, DWG, you can also convert to something such as a shape or JSON or geo package within QGIS. So the easiest is probably just to do the conversion and then import it into your Geo server, Geo node, so forth to manage and store the data. Okay. Yeah. yeah this is, I tried this. Thanks. Okay. Any last comments? Okay. Thank you. Uh, I would hand over now to Christian that would tell us about um, PV and building facades, etc. So thank you.